We already know how to compile simple programs and how to use simple compilation flags, but there are so many more that we can use and should use. So today we're going to be talking about the different compilation flags that we should be using when we compile our C++ code. And on that topic, when we already are talking about the compilation flags, we're also going to talk a little bit about how to debug your code using a debugger or any other technique. So by now you already know that there are some special symbols I use on the slides, so feel free to pause the video right here and uh, see them for yourself. So let's talk about these compilation flags. Before we have been using the minus std C++17 to specify that we want um, the compiler to compile our code as if it's written in C++ using C++17, uh, but there are more flags. So, for example, you could provide the minus "-o", flag, and this minus "-o", flag would tell the compiler what is the output file that you want to get. But there are many more flags. When you code in C++, a lot of things can go wrong if you're not careful. So, to make sure that you're careful, there are warnings baked into the C++ compilers. To enable all of these warnings, there is a bunch of flags that you can and should provide whenever you compile your code. The ones that uh, we will be using in this code are the minus w all, the minus w extra, the minus w pedantic, and then if you are inclined, and I really recommend to use this one too, minus w error. What do these stand for? They basically enable a bunch of different checks that the compiler can do on your code while compiling it, and trigger a warning if you're doing something wrong. And the last one, the minus W error, will make every warning an error so that you cannot ignore it. And I really, really cannot stress this strong enough. Whenever you compile your code, never leave warnings behind. They will bite you in the back afterwards. So just fix all the warnings and better just enable the minus W error for your code, whatever you uh, compile. There are other um, warnings that you can use, something like the minus W implicit fall through or the sign conversion, etc. Feel free to play around with those, and I will also leave a link uh, under the description so that you can see the different flags that are available for GCC and for Clang compilers. Now, another flag that is very important and uh, can change the behavior of your code significantly is the optimization flag, or the minus capital O. This minus capital O flag uh, is by default uh, uh, zero, meaning no optimizations will take place but you can set it to 1, 2, or 3, or minus 0, 1, minus 0, 2, and minus 0, 3, uh, which will enable progressively more optimizations. If you want your code to run as fast as possible, enable the minus 0, 3. We're not going to go into details here and now about this. We will do that much later in the course when we, when we know what actually happens under the hood and dig deeper into, uh, into what is the output of the compiler. But for now, just uh, um, the main thing that you have to take away from this lecture is that the higher the number, up to three, the more optimizations the compiler will actually do on your code and the faster the code will run. Finally, there is a flag to make sure that the debugging symbols are not stripped from the code. Generally, when the compiler compiles your code, there are debugging symbols like where is this code in the actual code base, where is the line of this code uh, and stuff like that. So if you want to uh, get rid of those symbols, uh, you don't have to do anything. The compiler already does it by default. But if you want to keep them, then you should provide the minus G flag because this flag makes sure that the compiler doesn't strip the debugging information. And it's very useful when we want to debug the code. Generally speaking, the code is going to be read many more times than it's written. And you're going to spend much more time on debugging your code than you will spend on writing this. There will be these really annoying small bugs that you will spend weeks to find, and then uh, you will find that, well, you missed uh, this one small thing in the logic that you had when you were building this whole thing up. So debugging is hard, um, and there are tools that help us to debug a little bit easier. Before we go into those, though, I really urge you to follow the link uh, here on this slide, and I will also leave it in the description uh, of this video. It, it's more like a a thought process that you have to have whenever you want to debug something. Because debugging is really annoying and it really helps to have the correct mindset uh, for it. Now with the mindset uh, out of the way, we should talk a little bit about the different tools that are available for us. 
And generally speaking, there are two big camps of uh, how people debug their code. The one camp is uh, people who debug with print statements, and the other camp is the people who debug with a debugger. I would say that there is no clear winner or loser in between these two, um, these two methods. They're both useful in their own ways. I personally debug much more with print statements than I do with uh, the actual debugger, but there are cases when you really cannot go around um, and you have to use a debugger. So a lot of people have uh, had a lot of holy wars about this topic, so you can uh, maybe start with reading this Hacker News article that I will also link, but uh, I don't really want to go into discussions of what is better, this or that. Uh, here I will just present the two options and uh, you decide for yourself what works for you. So let's start with the print statements. It's actually pretty easy, right? So you have a, an error, something happens that you did not expect. What you do is you start putting print statements uh, in your code to understand which part of the code is the last one that is being executed. The ones that I use look something like this. They have this double underscore file, double underscore line. These things will just be replaced with the actual file and the actual line that you are calling this particular line of code from. And then you can, of course, pass any value that you want uh, into, this, into this print statement. And then at some point, some of your print statements will not trigger because they will be beyond the border of what fails in your code. Now, that is the interesting part, right? So that's the part where you have to take a step back, look at what happens, and try to build a hypothesis of what is the, the, the reason behind this. Why is your code behaving the way it behaves? So you cannot really circumvent understanding what the code does. Please don't try to just mash everything together and try to make it work in one way or another. You really have to understand what is going on in your code. So when you see a certain print statement not printing and you expected it to print, now your previous hypothesis of what happens in your code is wrong. Now you have to build a new one. And then after you've built this hypothesis, you have to check it again. You have to go into your code, make the changes, rerun it again and see what changed, right? Did you actually fix the problem or did you not? Okay, so, but that's kind of about the way it goes, right? I really like this method because most of the times the errors are solved in your head and not with a certain tool. At least that's the case for me. One more thing to note here, and this will be much more relevant when we start building libraries and stuff like that. Um, you generally have to rebuild only part of your code when you're, when you're doing this. So if you have um, a certain wrong behavior in a certain part of the code, you just add print statements around it, and that's the only part of the code that you generally have to rebuild. Also, you do not have to, uh, to change, you don't have to provide the minus G flag, you don't have to have the debug symbols enabled, you can run this with all of the, uh, with all of the optimizations enabled and it still will run, right? So uh, that's a very non-intrusive way of finding the bugs. Although, of course, sometimes the bugs will be so deep in your code that a lot of stuff will have to be rebuilt, you cannot really go around this in this particular case. Right, and now that we discussed this, let's uh, jump towards the, uh, the other way um, of debugging by using the debugger. Now, what it allows us to do, it allows us to stop the program while it's being executed and then look around, like what is the state of every variable and stuff like that. It's really helpful because then this way you can actually see if something is off. Like if you know that this variable should be zero and it's not a zero, then you know that something is off. And again, it brings you back to the position where you have to understand, oh yeah, but what changes this variable? And you can also have a bunch of tools like watches and stuff like this. Basically you can watch whenever this variable gets changed. And if somebody changes it without you giving your consent for it, then uh, you know that you found your bug, right? That, that's, that's the nice situation. Now you can fix it and uh, you can rebuild your code and everything is gonna be fine. The problems with the compiler start with the way we have to compile our code. We actually have to provide the minus G flag and if we are using any form of other libraries um, and the bug happens to be in them or because of how we call them, then those also have to be compiled with the minus G flag, which is not always available. Also, when we uh, give it a minus G flag, the usual way is to try to disable the optimizations. But um, sometimes the bugs only happen when there are optimizations enabled. And so this gets really, really tricky and complicated. And uh, 
at that point in time, I think you're better off with sprint statements. But that being said, it's a very, very powerful way of debugging. So if you know your tools, then uh, you can be extremely efficient in this. Speaking about tools, the uh, most well-known tools uh, um, that I'm aware of are the GDB and the LLDB. There is also the Microsoft Visual C++ compiler, but because I don't work on Windows uh, or never really worked in Windows in my, in my career, I don't really know much about it, so I will focus on the GDB and LLDB uh, debuggers here. Now, these debuggers um, are extremely powerful and they are usually pre-installed on different systems. On Macs, you will find the LLDB already pre-installed if you have your C++ pipeline installed, and on Linux, usually GDB is already there. I think the, the most useful part of the, um, of the debuggers is the fact that they can print a backtrace. So after something has failed, they can actually print the backtrace back at you. This is a feature that I use a lot when there is like a, a, a failure that I cannot hypothesize my way into and I have to dig a bit deeper to understand what happens right before this failure happens. The only problem with uh, these uh, debuggers is that, well, they don't really have a graphical user interface. So you have to be pretty com comfortable working with a terminal. And for that, you can watch the video about the terminal that I recorded before. It, it really, like, you get there. Like, you have to start using them, and then at some point it, it starts feeling natural. But on the start, I, I give you that. It can be pretty intimidating. The best advice that I can give is just uh, start using those and uh, then figure stuff out uh, as you go. If you are not inclined to actually learn the tools uh, in their command line interface, then there is a bunch of tools that actually build on top of those and build a proper graphical user interface. The ones that I've used uh, before are the GDB GUI, which is, I think, a Python wrapper around the GDB, and then uh, it opens up the whole like uh, web-based or browser-based uh, graphical user interface where you can create breakpoints, uh, like the points where your code will stop the execution, and like look around your code base uh, much more easily. Um, also, VS Code integrates uh, with uh, those debuggers, so if you can set up uh, VS Code for that. Now, with all of these things out of the way, let's uh, probably have a small example of how things uh, can actually work. So let's start with a simple program. We have uh, some vector and we want to iterate from, uh, uh, from the last element to the, to the first element and want to print those uh, elements out. Kind of looks okay, right? But when we run it, at some point it uh, segfaults. It does print a lot of things uh, at us, but um, it does segfault in the end. So there is clearly a bug there. Let's try to find it. Now, when we work with the print statements, the way we do it is we try to like build a hypothesis of what can be the bug. And so we, we do that here and we think, well, okay, um, we have this access into the vector and uh, probably that is going wrong because the segmentation fault can happen when we access memory that we should not be accessing. So let's look at the variable that we iterate over um, with like the, the i variable. Let's print it out and let's also limit that to, let's say, 10 iterations. And then when we do that, we see, oh, then after the third or fourth iteration, we get this huge number. Why that? And at this point, this is very close to the solution to our problem. We now see exactly uh, what happens. We have a reproducible error. It will always happen like this. Um, the number is always going to be the same. And this is nice, right? So from this point on, we can actually work with this and try to figure out what happens. And this is the part where we actually have to know things, like we have to understand what happens here. And if you still don't know what happens here, then uh, there is a link on the slide, uh, and uh, I will link a video uh, on the top of the screen too, where I talk about this problem uh, in the previous lecture. But I will not give it out here. And if you know how to solve it, then uh, feel free to leave a comment below with your solution to this. And at this, we can actually switch over to the debugger way and try to do the same things just using the debugger. So we have this, uh, this program and we can compile this program with the like C++ minus std equals C++17 minus g because we want the debugger um, to, to work here. We want the output to be whatever, let's call it test, and let's uh, build our debug program here. We can run the, this test and we can see the segmentation fault in the end, so that's fine, right? So it still fails. 
Now let's actually run it in the debugger. For that, we have to call the LLDB and uh, we just uh, provide the test executable after it. Cool, now we are actually in the LLDB prompt and that means that we can uh, perform different actions here. So it's a prompt that will, uh, we kind of live in this uh, LLDB environment now and there are specific to LLDB commands that we can run here. So one of these commands, the standard one is the run command or we can trigger it by just pressing R and then pressing enter. So. Now, this has run the, uh, the program and uh, it shows us a couple of things. It shows us that the program has actually failed and that it failed on this line, on line six of our, of our code. Um, well, we kind of know this because there, there's really not that much happening in our program. So we know that it fails on line six, but we don't know why. So let's try to, uh, to understand a little bit more about this. For that, we can uh, set a breakpoint and uh, to set a breakpoint in LLDB, um, they actually use a much more verbose syntax than in GDB, which I like much more. So what you do is you have to set this breakpoint and for that you type uh, breakpoint and also you can use tab completion here. You have to provide the, the word set, then you want to provide the file. So you want to use the file debug CPP and you want to set it to line six. Okay, cool. Now it writes us that the breakpoint is set and we can restart our program and it will stop at this breakpoint. So we type R again. It asks us, hey, do we want to kill the old program and uh, maybe, maybe re restart it again? We want to and uh, we just either click enter or type Y and click enter here. And well, now we've, uh, we've actually restarted the whole thing. Now you can see here that uh, the stop reason is that we reached the breakpoint. So now we are at this breakpoint. And the cool part about this is that now we can watch a certain variable and let's watch the, the I variable because that's the one that we are actually interested in. So for that, we have to do the watch set uh, variable I. And now we basically set the, uh, the watch on this variable and it says that the new value of this uh, variable is three. Now, so what do we do next? We have to continue the execution of our program and that we do with type in C and then type in enter. So now we see that it triggered on a watch point and uh, this is the same as uh, triggering on the, on the break point, but it triggers whenever the variable that we watch changed changes its value. So cool. Now uh, you can also see that the new value is two. So our, our value of our, actually let's scroll a bit up. So the watch point one hit and it says the old value was three, the new value was two. And that's good, right? Like that's uh, what we want to see. The value is decrementing. So let's continue execution by typing C. And uh, you can see that now the stop reason is that we hit a breakpoint. We're not really interested in this anymore. We are more interested in the watch point here. So let's continue doing that. We see the new value is one. Let's do it again. The new value is zero. And now is the interesting part. That's what we, where we expected the code to stop. But if we now execute it again, that then we can scroll up and we can see that the watch point one has been hit and the old value was zero, but the new value is this huge number again. That's great. We now see that uh, something is happening that we did not expect. And now we can build a hypothesis of what happens here. And I leave that to you as a small exercise. If you do not know what happens here, then there is a link on the slide that leads you to a different lecture of mine where I explain why this happens. And there is also a link to the video that explains that in the description to this video. On this, you know a little bit more about the different flags that you should use. You know that you should be using the warnings uh, all the time. And uh, you also know how to use a debugger and generally how to think about debugging a program and which different methods you have in your toolbox. So I hope that this knowledge is going to be useful for you whenever you debug the programs that are coming in this course and then in your programming career. Thank you and uh, see you in the next videos. Bye.